time for this group to to generate ideas. We've got a lot to get through today, so I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I'm going to move on to agenda item number two, which is the minutes of the last meeting on June the 8th, which has been circulated, and also any matters arising. Can I just ask if anybody has any issues with the minutes or any matters arising, just to put it in the chat function? If not, I will just take it that they will be agreed. Okay, nothing in the chat function, thank you. And we are now going to move to the AGM business where I will ask Phil Prentice, who's a Chief Officer of Scotland's Town Partnership to take over. Thanks, Convener. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, could I just begin the AGM section by asking the MSPs to nominate our Convener, please? That can be done with your hand up uh, to speak or put it into the chat bar. Neil Bebby's just joining. Okay. I think maybe some of the MSPs are just running slightly late. So if Neil's here. Neil, I'll just repeat that. Could we ask for a nomination for the convener, please. That needs to come from an MSP. Oh, yes, yes. I would be delighted to nominate Siobhan Brown to be a convener. That's fantastic. Okay. Sorry, sorry, I was slightly late logging on there. Apologies. Uh, Siobhan, I can hand back to you now to nominate the deputy conveners. That's great. Thank you, Phil. And thank you, Neil, for the nomination. Um, we'll now move on to nominations for deputy conveners. And I was going to nominate Megan Gallagher, MSP, and also Neil Bibby, MSP. Can I have somebody to second that? I'm happy to second that, Sean. Okay, thanks, Phil. And Neil, you're happy to be deputy convener? Yes, we're delighted to. Great. Okay, thank you. And now we've got um, nominations for secretary, and I was going to nominate or propose um, Alison Jones from Scotland Towns Partnership. Could someone second that? I'll second that, Siobhan. Thank you very much. And I was also going to nominate as treasurer Elaine Bone from Scotland Town Partnership. Happy to second again. That's great. Thank you. That's all the formal nominations. Congratulations to everybody. Uh, next section of the AGM is our annual report. An annual report will be submitted to the Scottish Parliament following this meeting, a copy of which will be shared online and also available online. And the report outlines all the activity that we've been doing in the past year. So since its reconstitution last year, the group has covered the following topics at meetings which is culture and place, community wealth building and towns, and towns beyond retail. The forward plan is to support the CPG Secretariat. Attendees are also asked to submit any potential topic ideas to Alison Jones or Elaine Bone at Scotland's Town Partnership as we move forward on to the next year. So that can completes the section of our AGM. And we'll now move on to today's topic, which is climate emergencies and towns. And if I could introduce Phil Prentice again, the Chief Officer of Scotland Town Partnership, just to say a few words. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Convener. Um, obviously, over the last month or so, everybody has been made aware of the, um, the issue around energy. Towns were originally designed to be eco towns in Scotland, and I think we really need to start working fastly and swiftly towards delivering uh, on climate action using our towns as vehicles to, to help with that. The new future for Scotland's towns and the, uh, the joint Scottish Government and COSLA response does clearly outline the need for more action around climate and energy and sustainability for our towns. And we're going to hear from a range of actors today who are actually starting to shape up that agenda and to undertake operational projects across the country. But if we just think simply about Look, net zero housing, active travel, about uh, the green agenda, about lollipop trees and rainwater gardens and green walls and solar panels. This can be done. We can actually use our towns as critical economic, social and environmental infrastructure to deliver key outcomes around climate. So without further ado, we have a busy agenda. I'm just going to hand back to the convener. Thanks for your time. 
Thank you, Phil. And we'll move on to the next se session, um, section, sorry. And a very warm welcome to Dr. Emily Wadsworth, um, who is the Operations Director of Green Action Trust, and who will be covering delivering environmental and regeneration outcomes for Scotland. Welcome, Emily. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, I want to just echo what, what Phil has just said. I think that um, not only can we um, use our towns and cities to deliver climate um, change uh, uh, retribution, and we absolutely should and we absolutely must. So um, I'll just share straight on with my screen. Um, hopefully you can see all of that. I'm sure Alison will shout if not. Right, so yes, I've got a very quickly talk about uh, environmental and net zero solutions for regeneration. Um, anybody who's seen me present before knows that I can talk a lot. Um, and so I'm going to try and keep it very short today and uh, apologize if I end up speaking very, very quickly. Um, but yes, I'm Emily Wadsworth. I'm Operations Director with the Green Action Trust. Uh, Green Action Trust is an environmental charity that's been working in and around mainly the central belt of Scotland, but now Scotland wider for the last few, for probably about 35 to 40 years. And our key uh, modus operandi is to use the environment in order to regenerate areas of, and deliver social and economic benefit uh, alongside that. Contrary to what a lot of perception seems to be, the environment is not mutually exclusive from social issues and economic in issues. Um, sadly, it's not the norm, but they can be done together. So I'm going to spend the next five minutes running through a couple of examples that I hope will give you a bit of inspiration on how we can actually start to regenerate our cities and towns with both biodiversity and climate crises in mind. One of the, I suppose, key things that um, we do within towns and cities is to regenerate the public realm. And that does not have to be done just um, with grey infrastructure. Um, Copenhagen is a, a green infrastructure city, which is cited in a lot of examples. And the, the thing I wanted to pull out for you today is, is Tassingi Square. Um, there was a very severe flood event uh, in Copenhagen in 2011, which caused some severe flooding and a lot of damage to various parts of the city. Rather than just putting in pipes and making underground drainage better, they opted to look at creating climate adapted urban green space instead, and this is across the whole of the city. The Singer Square is one of the first um, projects they did. On the, the left there you can see as it was in 2010, lots of grey infrastructure, lots of roads, a very small token piece of green infrastructure up at the top there. That was completely regenerated over the course of a couple of years and the right hand image is what it looks like today. Um, it's, uh, so the photograph has basically been flipped um, initially, that this first one is taken from this little point down here so you can see all of this road has been dug up um, and turned into a community green space. They've removed so much grey, they've added in a lot of green and they've created both social and economic benefits alongside climate mitigation, climate adaptation, um, biodiversity, air pollution, um, all those kind of environmental benefits that you might expect from green space improvements. This uh, road down the side here, on the bottom floor of the blocks of flats are shops and um, community spaces. They now all have outside uh, areas that they can use. Uh, the parking has been reduced, allowing much better um, access, easier access for, um, for people that want to, to, to walk and cycle there, um, allowing those businesses to, to basically expand. The whole square itself has got social um, enterprise built into it and it is used very regularly um, as, a, as a social space. This area of Copenhagen has now been designated as the climate quarter when all the streets, the redevelopment of the streets and the squares that are going to go on forward will be adapted with climate um, in mind. The second one I want to touch on is uh, re refurbishing or redeveloping um, buildings in particular. This is something that we often end up having to do in towns and cities as well. The Oslo Waterfront is a huge project regenerating the whole of Oslo Waterfront. Google it and be prepared to spend an, at least an afternoon looking through all of the stuff. Um, they have changed 
all of the industrial spaces that have fallen into dereliction over the last 20, 30 years or so, and they are creating a thriving residential and commercial area that's got fantastic connections into the main, main city. And this is in response to population increases that they started to see and that they um, started to expect in the, the coming years. They have the one project that I thought I'll, I'll pull out here is, is this one. This is uh, Soronga Key, which was an old shipping container port, vacant derelict land. The picture on the left I took when I was there in September 2019. Um, and the picture on the right is one that I managed to, to get off a of contact just last week of what has been built in, in that space now. It's um, some social and affordable housing in this area that's been built. This, I think there's six blocks and this image on here is one of the first ones that's gone in. Um, so it's a social affordable housing. It has green roofs and green walls. Um, it's got internal courtyards of green space and, and social gathering spaces. It's got active travel links to the city centre down to the waterfront itself where you can actually go swimming in the bay. I'm not sure I'd want to do that in Oslo. It's a little bit chilly. Um, but it's got incredibly good um, rain gardens and water management all built into the building and the surrounding green space. Um, they, this is just one of many projects they're delivering across o Oslo waterfront. Um, it's just, um, um, if you get to go, go, I think it's absolutely, uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, a third thing that we're doing a lot of at the moment is active travel. There's a big push to get active travel infrastructure into our towns and cities um, and between our towns and cities as well. There's a lot of mon money available for the grey infrastructure, but the green infrastructure is just as important. There is research that shows that um, off-road or on-road, slightly aggregated on-road active travel routes are more attractive, they're more appealing to use, they're, they feel safer, um, they also suffer less from, from flooding and, and things like that. Quick example here is Sheffield. I'm sure lots of you have heard of the Greater Green Project in Sheffield, where they uh, installed a whole load of rain gardens and other surface water measure, uh, measurements into the creation of new active travel routes through the city. This is the, one of the main streets um, that is, it's gone from being a dual carriageway to a single carriageway in response to uh, reduced car capacity in that particular area of the city. And they put this entire section here um, into a quite large active travel route and uh, rain gardens. So this is the court building and you can see it here as well. So this has been direct replacement from that. This is in, in 2015 and then in 2016, and this is what it looks now into, well, 2019, I think this image was taken. This is that same court building. So you can see it's changed an awful lot and has genuinely created a segregation from a busy road, um, providing biodiversity, air pollution, um, water management as well. Um, we all know that green infrastructure has benefits. Um, these are well cited, uh, they're well talked about quite a lot. Um, but within towns and cities, green infrastructure can also be used to encourage people to come into the city centre. It can help them feel safer, more welcoming, perhaps encouraging people to linger if there are attractive places to sit and enjoy the sunshine, such as we've had over the last summer. That can in turn support social benefit, local businesses. You might attract more people into your town and as to say, going to an out of town retail park. So, Green infrastructure absolutely can and absolutely should be used to help regenerate towns and cities. My last slide, you'll be glad to know, is this one, and I'm sure many of you have seen this before. Um, and it's just, I suppose, to, to reiterate that whilst it's relatively uncommon for projects that have been delivered from economic drivers to also deliver social and environmental benefits as well, projects that stem from an environmental background be as a primary driver or as a secondary driver usually deliver both economic and social benefits as well they are not mutually exclusive and um, at the very worst we're going to make the world a nicer place um, you're not going to do any harm by using an environmental method if you can and i'm going to stop there because i've probably run out of time Thanks so much, Emily. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we are doing all right for time. So I did see um, Jacqueline Bell, you've got your hand up. Did you want to come in and ask a question? Is that all right with you, Emily? Yes, yes, fine. I think you just have to unmute Jacqueline. Yeah, no, just referring to some work that my husband does. Uh, he works between uh, Edinburgh University, uh, um, the, the 
open space program in landscape architecture. Oh, but more yeah. importantly, he's at the University of Life Sciences at Tartu in Estonia, has done a lot of work. And there is e, was EU Horizon 2020 money yeah. invested in projects on uh, green and blue spaces. I can't actually find the book, but <laughs> it's out there. But lots of regeneration in various towns and cities, including Barcelona, yeah. Tallinn, uh, Portsmouth, all over the place. Yeah. So just thinking people might want to look up that research. And to be yeah, absolutely, Jacqueline. I think that's a it's a great idea. I mean, there are so many examples I could have used, but only having seven minutes, uh, I had to whittle it down. But um, Glasgow is a really good one as well through the Connecting uh, Nature one. That is also um, Horizon 2020 funded. There, there is a lot out there, uh, and it's done. Sometimes it's done quite piecemeal. So that's yeah, that's no. another question. Just but Blue Health was certainly a really, really big project. And it was one of these things that I think has shown how important EU funding was for research and, uh, you know, cross uh, ideas across the EU. That's People great. I want to look it up. Thanks, Jacqueline. And I'm just going to ask Simon Bell. OK. Yes, I'm I'm also, the slideshows that we'll be seeing today, Alison, is it possible for these to be emailed to everyone that attends so they can see them in more detail and they have a bit more time to look over them if they wish? Okay, I'm good. There are a few questions, but we'll move on. And I think what we'll do is it will take questions at the end, if that's all right. So we'll move on to tackling the climate emergency and livable towns for everyone. And welcome Claire Daly, who's the Head of Policy and Communications for Sustrand Scotland. Hi there, just bear with me and I'll get my um, presentation up. Uh, kind of already here. Sorry about this, losing seconds. Nope. Can you see that now? Not yet. Okay, just bear with. I can share for you, it's clear. What's that? Sorry. I think it was just a bit. Oh, just, uh, just, yes, yes, we've got it now. Well, oh, you've got it up for me. We've Thank got it you now. very yeah. much. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. Um, just to say, having having seen Emily's uh, presentation, I think I can just go home and have my lunch because this. Uh, it, thank you very much. It was absolutely fascinating and a lot of the things that we want to talk about um emily has talked about as well but um if we can just move on please um uh, can you go to the next slide uh just just a thought there i'm not going to read it out but essentially when we're talking about cities and towns uh, cities consume 78 percent of the world's energy produce 60 percent of the world's it has gas emissions, yet they only account for less than 2% of the Earth's surface, and that's from UN Habitat. Um, can you move on to the next one, please? Um, just a bit about Sustrans. We're working to create livable cities and towns for everyone, and essentially places that connect us to each other and what we need, where everyone can thrive without having to use a car. So a couple of I won't read these out, but essentially uh, these are the elements of what a livable city or town for everyone is. And you may be asking yourselves, what's that got to do with a climate emergency? Well, in essence, what we're talking about is the space that we use for cars, we could be using for better social connections. I've gone back to it. Yeah, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so you, I'm sure everybody here will recognize this graphic from the um, Town Centre Action Plan. And key words in there are the climate environmental, planning infrastructure and transport, health and well-being, housing, inclusion and fairness uh, uh, and, and social and culture, because in fact, all of these things tap into livability. If we're tackling the climate emergency in towns, there are areas we need to look at. Transport buildings, if you can just press the next, uh, energy efficiency, 
uh, greening our town centres and neighbourhoods. And this ties very much in with what Emily was talking about as well in terms of green and blue infrastructure. And finally, as I was saying earlier, using space differently. Next slide, please. Um, now, this is a familiar site to many of us. Uh, this is the kind of now, if we like. Um, and I'm just going to talk a bit about transport. Decarbonisation of transport in our town, because that's the top area, will not just support climate change mitigation, but will also play, a, if we can go back to the previous slide, please, um, will also play a role in adaptation. Cars, as we know, uh, cause up to nearly 40% of transport emissions in Scotland. And even if every new car sold in Scotland in 2030 was electric, we'd still need to reduce overall car mileage by about 20% to meet our climate commitments. And that is what's behind the um, Scottish government ambition to reduce car kilometres by 20%. Um, at the moment, what we're dealing with is a transport system that's based on a one size fits all approach based around a metal box, a car, um, and then talking, linking into the cost of living crisis. Um, in 2017, Sustrans published research on transport poverty in Scotland. Transport poverty, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is where somebody is uh, basically where a household income is squeezed to such an extent by uh, the necessity of having to own and run a car where people have no option but to own and run a car because they don't have alternative transport options or where their cities and towns where their, their their towns are where they're living um the opportunities to access work and other services requires ownership of a car um and that of course was done in 2017 before we have the current cost of living crisis and cost of petrol. Um, interestingly, we found that 20% of people in Scotland live at, in areas of high risk of transport poverty. And uh, the worst affected areas, in fact, were small accessible towns. Okay, can we have the next slide? So this is just a quick one, skip over to the next one. What could we do if we have a bit more space? Um, and I think you've seen lots of lovely images from what Emily talked about earlier. On, on different use of space. So if we, can you move on to the next slide then, please? Um, what you'll see there, I'm just going to describe these pictures before we move on to some of the text. Um, 20 minute neighborhoods we think are key, building active travel routes uh, where people can access what they need within a 10 minute walk of where they live. And when I say what they need, it's things like shops, retail, um, services, bank, possibly a work or work hub, um, green space, an important part of that. Um, and in the Town Centre Action Plan, many of these concepts, you'll see them there, 20 minute neighbourhoods, Town Centre living, intergenerational living, use of brownfield sites, etc. Um, they were all mentioned, but the key enabler has to be repurposing space that is currently used either for car parking, car storage, or um, uh, for, for routes through the city uh, to repurpose those for active travel. Um, and if we focus just on the buildings and not on the connections between spaces, then if you see that strange little diagram in the corner, if I had a pointer, I would point it, but that is a typical um, uh, layout of a small town where you have in the dark orange a, a medieval town centre then uh, some victorian su suburbs in the light uh, in, in in the lighter beige and then the white area i don't know if you can see that but they are all 1950s and 1970s um council or sorry uh, um suburb cul-de-sac housing developments and what that does is it creates car dependency so we need a different approach to how we use our space and how we plan our streets next slide please um, walkability is key to using space social connection is really important 
Um, and you'll see there uh, up above where people working on planters, that's on the South City Way in Glasgow. And um, there's also some images of art in, um, in, in uh, part of Glasgow, a community art project where the community were involved in creating art near an active travel route uh, funded through the Sustrans Art Roots program. And then uh, just there in the foreground is my little boy and his friend uh, on space hoppers on the street where we live in Leith in Edinburgh during lockdown. So again, it's just space that can be used differently. Um, next slide, please. So who's already doing it? I I think we've had plenty of examples and I think it's just really, really important to talk about how active travel um, can facilitate uh, what um, we're talking about, green and blue infrastructure and how they go hand in hand. Uh, what you see there, um, top image is the Stockingfield Bridge in Glasgow by, by the canal and that will be opened, I believe, uh, in two weeks time, the grand opening is later on. Um, but all in that area of Glasgow, you have um, connecting Woodside as a project which connects different communities in North Glasgow. Um, there's the Clay Pits Nature Reserve uh, picture there on the bottom right, uh, which is one of the largest urban nature reserves. Um, and again, active travel routes through it. Um, and connecting basically from North Glasgow right into the city centre on Sutley Hall Street. So, um, and then just before we move on, there's the Scottish Borders Council have a very um, imaginative project uh, around in Hoyk, which of course has been badly affected by flooding. And you can see there, uh, that's a, a, a visualisation of uh, what they've done where there's the river flood prevention, they've also supplemented it with a whole set of active travel routes alongside the river that's kind of been built into the whole project. There are many, many others. And what I'd like us to see is getting people talking to each other about what they're doing. Um, last of all, then final slide. Um, Here's the question, how do the streets you live on? Ask the people, ask the little people in your life. Um, and this is how we start with redesigning streets. How do the streets where you live make you feel and how can they be made better? And very often what you see is images of livability are associated with green space, play space, flashes of color, not this. Uh, and 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 just making places better you can see i i certainly know where i would prefer to live uh, of those ones shown so that's me thank you very much thank you very much claire um i think what if anybody wants to put any comments or questions in the chat we did have councillor yeah. van der horn say that he lived in copenhagen and he knows that the project that you had mentioned and being a cycling city with good tr public transport was key. This means that we have to do, the, to do this here and to make this happen um, in partnership with Claire is discussing about livability. So thank you very much for that, Claire. It was very interesting. And um, we'll move on to the next one, who is um, warm welcome to Caroline Warburton, who's a regional leadership director for Visit Scotland. And you'll be discussing developing a responsible approach to tourism. Thank you. Thanks very much, Siobhan. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, Alison, I think you're gonna share my slides. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, I guess it's a little bit, and now for something uh, different. Uh, I'm going to take a slightly different approach uh, and look at it at national level and I suppose from the tourism industry's perspective in terms of where um, we are looking at um, driving a more responsible approach to tourism. Obviously tourism is dependent on place on great places to uh, people to visit. So we are uh, integral, I hope, to a lot of the considerations um, around towns and town centres. We benefit from those positive changes that we've heard about um, already um, as we bring visitors into our, into our places. So I can't possibly do justice to this in seven minutes. So I'm gonna give, as I say, quite a top line overview. Have the next slide, please, Alison. 
um, you'll be all too aware of the pressures that we are under at the moment as a society and as, as a planet. Um, tourism is uh, being affected by uh, most of these, if not all of them, but I think uh, it's also fair to say that tourism also contributes to some of them, and I think we, we recognise that. From a Scotland position, uh, tourism sits within um, a policy and a legal context that you can see on the screen, and these are just some of the um, uh, uh, policies that we are um, trying to help implement um, as a sector but the two in the center are probably the key ones for us um, uh, as a focus at the moment so on the right is the national strategy for economic transformation with that focus on a well-being economy and what does that mean from a visitor perspective as well as from um, a local perspective and the um, Scotland Outlook 2030 is the national tourism strategy which is very much about um, providing uh, a responsible tourism for a sustainable future. So the issues around responsibility, sustainability, uh, the uh, climate change agenda very much embedded in the strategic approach that we have um, as a tourism sector. Next slide, please, Alison. So what I wanted to do was really just to talk a little bit about what this term means. Um, I'm sure many of you will be saying this is just the same as sustainable tourism. Um, and in some ways um, it is, um, but it's a bit more of an active uh, definition and one which we feel is a bit more um, uh, action oriented. So the approach we've adopted is one of responsibility. And this means that everybody, whoever you are, however you're involved in tourism, whether you are government, an agency like ourselves, whether you are a business, whether you are a traveler, whether you are a destination or a community, we all have a responsibility to try and make um, our sector uh, and our places more sustainable. And I guess the, the best way to put this is through the quote um, at the bottom of this slide, which came from Professor Harold Goodwin, which is around uh, where what we're trying to do is to create better places for people to live in, which in turn create better places uh, for people to visit. Um, and that order of that sentence is, is really key. Uh, next uh, slide, please, Alison. So from a Visit Scotland perspective, we have um, taken the opportunity through COVID to really step back and review what it is that we are trying to deliver here in light of both NSET, but also Scotland Outdoor and also speaking to the industry and looking ahead to the opportunities that are coming. And we've um, embedded these four pillars within our own strategic framework. And there is activity um, which it is influencing internally within what we're doing at the moment, but also um, externally in terms of how we are presenting Scotland as a destination. So very quickly, the, um, the role that we have in supporting Scotland's transition to the low carbon economy. Um, and recently, we've been working with destinations around climate action plans. This is part of the Glasgow Declaration, which was signed um, by key members of the tourism industry around the world uh, on the back of COP26. Um, and we've had Scottish Government recovery funding to support three destinations to go through a pilot. We know destinations are really, really keen to get involved um, in this agenda. And so it's trying to learn from each other as to how we can um, help these activities um, moving forwards. Communities are key. We need to get that balance right, that communities uh, do not feel that tourism is something that is done to them, that they have an active voice and an active role in shaping what that tourism industry looks like. And from our perspective as the tourist board, a lot of what we're trying to do is to ensure that we have both seasonal and regional spread. So we're not just focusing on the honeypots, that we're encouraging visitors where it's appropriate to visit lesser known places and at perhaps less busy times of the year. And we're constantly having those conversations with destinations and communities as to what is right for them. The inclusivity agenda is obviously very, very important in terms of if tourism is to be available to, to all. So we've done a lot of work around accessibility statements, ensuring that businesses are able, in a position to um, explain how they are accessible to people, to different people, and working on a programme that we call Scott Spirit, which is about providing breaks to low-income families and, and people with, uh, with disabilities and carers, which again was supported through recovery funding. 
And last but very much not least is around uh, how do we get that balance right between promoting and encouraging people to visit our natural and our cultural heritage without having that negative impact on it. And an example of that recently is the visitor management campaign that we've been working with so many partners um, across Scotland on and Visit Scotland has been leading on that working group uh, in terms of the respect, protect, uh, enjoy campaign keep Scotland unspoiled and it's really around some of the challenges that we had over the last couple of years with certain particularly rural areas um, that saw huge influxes of people and that were being loved to death um, and how do we help people to understand their role their responsibility um, in their access to the environment and to these um, to these special places next slide please Alison so um, from a Visit Scotland perspective, we've looked at, well, where are the areas that we can influence? We can't single-handedly revolutionize the tourism sector, but we do have a role to play in that. And we've identified these four areas. So one is around the industry. So what is our role as the tourist board, as um, Visit Scotland, to um, provide best practice, to encourage the adoption of responsible tourism practices? And we know that there are so many businesses out there that are already doing incredible work. And how can we help share that uh, and provide that sort of central point uh, for those activities and a lot of that is being shared on our industry website which is visitscotland.org. Also the communities, so where is our role in facilitating conversations, helping to use some of the great examples that we've heard already today to, um, uh, to, to promote those um, and to encourage others destinations to adopt similar activities. Our visitors, obviously as tourist board, we're doing marketing and promotion and how do we present Scotland as a destination that is welcoming to visitors who behave themselves and who do, um, we want the right type of visitor, um, one who can appreciate um, the, the responsible tourism messages that we're um, as, a, as a society, as a nation are, are keen to get across. And last but not least, as I say, is our internal. So what can we do as an organization ourselves? So we've been looking critically at our own buildings, at our own um, activities, and what can we do to reduce those, um, those uh, impacts there as well? Next slide, please, Alison. And it's not just because this is the right thing to do. Consumers are saying that they are looking for more sustainable activities. This is um, some results from a booking.com survey, um, and it had a sample of 30,000 people um, across 32 countries. So you can see there that this is not just um, um, a whim, this is something which consumers are now looking to have. Next slide, please, Alison. And so we're starting to shape and hopefully you'll start to see this. These are just some examples from visitscotland.com. So some of the content that we're creating, and this is all going um, throughout all of our campaigns. So our Scotland is calling campaign, um, and hopefully you'll start to see this and you can help and share um, the activity that we're doing. Um, and then just the last slide. Thank you, Alison. But we can't do this on our own. So uh, these are just a few of the partners that we're working with, as well as all of the destinations and the businesses um, that are happening. But hopefully it gives you a bit of a feel for um, the sort of change in tone, I think is probably the best way of putting it, not just ourselves, but all of the partners um, and the direction that we're heading in. Um, and we can start to create towns and places such as Emily and Claire have outlined that really are places that people want to live in, but also people want to visit. Thank you very much, Lorne. That's great. Thanks very much, Caroline. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to move on to our next speaker, who's Catherine Brown from External Affairs from Blashier. Is it Illuminations? Apologies if I... Pardon? It's Blashier Illumination, yes. Okay, yes, thank you. Welcome, and we're discussing protecting the planet, not just an option, but it's our duty. I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me for two seconds. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes, good. Um, so thank you, convener, for allowing us the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon. I'm going to be taking a completely different approach to everybody else um, and to hopefully shine a light on people will know that we provide festive lighting, but you may not be aware that we're global leaders in the provision of eco-responsible global lighting. In fact, we're probably eight to 10 years ahead of any of our competitors. Um, like all the other speakers, seven minutes isn't much time, so I will be speaking quickly, but I'm very grateful that you get to see all the slides afterwards. So I skip over a couple, it's just to save time. These 
figures are truly scary when we think of the amount of production of plastic bottles and where they end up. So the top 10 causes of death in the world, these might surprise you. I know they did me when I um, first saw these figures. I'll just quickly click them in. So the third highest cause of death in the world is pollution. And I'm probably talking to the preaching to the converted today, so apologies for that, but I still think the figures talk for themselves and they're a good reminder for all of us. Um, and the, 9,000 due to pollution, you'd have expected, I, I, I was expecting it to be way down the list if I'm honest, and the amount of animals that die in our oceans because of plastic that end up creating what's now known as the seventh continent, the vortex of plastic, that site is horrendous. Blacher have decided to try and play a small part, and we accept that it's a very small part in the bigger picture as to how we can try and address that and make it a better planet for the rest of us. Now, obviously, with population increasing, that makes, you know, plastic has increased over the years in line with the amount of people that want plastic bottles or historically have wanted plastic bottles. And the reality is, I'm not sure we're going to ever get away from them because they're, they're already in circulation. But what can we do? Yes, we can try and produce less plastic or we can reuse the existing plastics in a better way. And that's the avenue that we've chosen to go down. So we've invented Recyprint. I, I talk about this on a daily basis and I still get goosebumps. We can now produce you festive lighting made from recycled plastic bottles. I think that's amazing. Um, I'm gonna show you a very short video now which is gonna bring that to life for you. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it. If you can't, please shout. I don't think we can hear it, but we can read. So hopefully that gives you a brief insight to why we're so proud of what we're able to achieve. Currently, we've got giant, uh, nine robots that produce these items, but we're having to increase up to 15 next year because our goal next year is that everything in our catalogue will be made from recycling. The, it's a much superior product to the bioprint, so we'll be getting rid of the bioprint product and sticking with recycling. And, and I think it's a bit more because people, everybody, accept can understand the logic of something being made from a recycled plastic bottle whereas the honest answer is not everybody quite understood something made from a sugarcane based product and we were we were asked silly questions like will they dissolve in the water um, so this is a much more understandable um, and educational scheme we have these amazing eco whales which house an industrial size bin they can be placed in your town center on your seafronts wherever you choose and not only is it obviously educational it's made from the recycled plastic bottles itself it houses the bin that people can place their recycled plastic bottles in um, and people just love coming taking their photos with it so it's a photo op it increases your footfall in town centers it's a win-win um, but the main thing for us is obviously it's educational. Um, and the more children we can educate um, to make sure for their future lives that we have a better planet, it has to be a good thing. 
We are now showing it in our catalogue, the amount of bottles it takes to make items. And I think that's a really powerful message is when councils you know, look at things like their festive lighting, that they can actually then say to their um, electorate, well, you know, we're using this company for this reason, and this is the amount of um, bottles that we'll be saving um, by doing so. So yeah, whilst we're producing the Christmas lightings, we're trying to clear up the mess that's currently out there in the planet. Not so, we show all the, the different aspects from the height, the width, but for me, it's, it's a really, really um, good tool for, for you in your meetings to be able to see the amount of bottles. And you might be pleasantly surprised. I would have thought it'd been a lot more than 171 for something of that scale. And I've just literally whizzed through these. But I think it's a clear message for you um, as to what can be achieved by recycling. And they're pretty too. So obviously the more that we can produce, the less plastic bottles that we leave on the planet. Um, we obviously patented the technology so none of our competitors can offer you anything of the sort. They're still talking about using LED lights, which we've been doing for 20 years. Um, so we are, we are honestly years ahead of our competitors um, and we've paid an, an awful lot of money for the patent so they won't be able to touch us. We are extremely proud of a new partnership that we've recently undertaken and that is that WWF have recognised the work that we're doing so that's a huge thing for us they really don't hand out commercial partnerships very often um, so to be recognised by someone of their level, it's it's a huge thing for ourselves, um, and and hopefully for people that see these type of presentations will understand how committed we are to, to play our part, and it's it's all about the education, um, trying to work with the fishermen, with people out on the boats, etc. That there, there's several schemes, um, all of an educational basis. But the bottom line is. We are still Blush Air, we still provide festive lighting, we just do it in a much better and eco-friendly way now. And finish off with my details, but as uh, um, was already mentioned, the slides will be going out to you and I think I was ahead of time. But thank you thank very much for the opportunity. No, thank you, Catherine, that's absolutely fascinating. I didn't realise that was actually happening in Ainsley. I see that you'd like these put in place in, for press with Christmas and so would I, to be honest. Can I ask Catherine, are you working with any local authorities? Or? We're working with several in, in um, Scotland. Um, I don't have the full list, but I, I know quite a few of the main players. And there, there are even some whales in Scotland. So if you search out there, you'll find find a whale. I think there's one, I think there's one in Edinburgh now. If it's not already arrived, it's on its way. Um, but no, we, 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 we work. Our, our head office for the UK is in Lady Bank in Fife. So yeah, we're, we're very prominent in Scotland. Okay, but, yeah, no, that's fascinating. And I think the statistic, statistics that you showed at the beginning of, yeah, really, really frightening. Really scary. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now, if I may, I'm going to open it up to see if any of my MSP colleagues would like to comment or ask any questions. I'm sorry, but I can't see the, I can see the chat, but I can't see anyone's hands going up. So maybe... In the meantime, maybe if it, in, in, any MSP. Can I ask a question, Siobhan? Sorry. Yes, sorry. It, it's, it's mainly, thanks, uh, Siobhan. Um, it was just, I mean, I think public transport is is, is key um, to, to, to tackling the climate crisis. Um, I just wanted to, it's maybe for, mainly for Claire, but, but obviously um, others may have views on it. I just wondered to what extent the um, changes in the kind of LEZ schemes around cities, because they've been rolled out for cities and not towns, to what extent do we think there will be displacement from cities towards towns as a result of that? Um, obviously, that might bring car polluting cars to town centres as a result of that. I also, you know, there's obviously issues around the nighttime economy as well, particularly for town centres. And at the moment, there seems to be a real lack of taxis and taxi... Uh, there's a lack of bus services in the evening, but there's also a lack of taxis um, as a result of some of the changes in LEZs. And I just wondered if that is also seeing people maybe not, you know, uh, nighttime industry is obviously suffering greatly across the board, but is, is is that something that could, you know, potentially mean that people are less likely or more likely to access their town centre, local town centres to use the nighttime economy rather than big cities? I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question, Neil, and thanks for the question. Uh, I would say that I'm coming very much from an active travel perspective rather than a wider transport management perspective. Um, but uh, first of all, livability and attractiveness of place is a key thing to get getting people to places. Um, in cities, it, cities that are well set up for... Um, active travel, like, you know, we're always going back to Copenhagen and Oslo and Amsterdam, but they have, as you know, very vibrant uh, nighttime economies in, in those cities. And there are all kinds of mobility solutions that can be, um, that can be implemented. For example, you'll see in many cities, there are kind of uh, uh, time periods where um, there's increased vehicle access and particularly for pub well for public transport yes but also for taxis um night buses and you see this is a city thing i i would agree it's and and there are more challenges at a town level um but uh you, you know getting the opportunities i think it's about getting the balance right and um making our places more attractive to be in is I think a first step. And again, we're coming back to what we're talking about, which is the climate emergency um, and top, uh, topped with that with a, a cost of living crisis, having other options for transport, I think is going to be really, really important. Whether it is co-mobility, which I think is a really exciting opportunity, you know, uh, uh, um, where you can, uh, you know, like car clubs, uh, I think will, will fill an important gap. Um, there will be things like taxis and Uber and other things for the nighttime economy, having a good night bus network. Um, but certainly we will not support a, night econ a nighttime economy by having lots of people drive into town and who is the designated driver then. So I don't think we want to go down that route either. Um, but attractiveness of place is so important. I, I, th I think, you know... Nobody wants to be, nobody wants to be in a place that is packed with traffic. It's not an attractive place to be, whether it's you're coming out of a pub at, at midnight or whether you're going around town doing your shopping with a kid, with, with an older person. Nobody wants that. So how do we look after the people who really need to use cars and you know, like blue badge holders, etc. And then, how do we come up with other other transport options? Great, thank you very much, Claire. I'm going to take a question from Todd Ferguson, and I think this could be for you, Emily. Do we have measurable data from successful projects that demonstrate how communities have adapted to new active travel initiatives? I've had many discussions with constituents who have a real desire to move forward um, for better active travel and 20 minute neighborhoods in principle, but they often find it difficult to commit to change for a variety of reasons. Yeah, thanks, Siobhan. Um, I'm not going to point at Claire, but I think some of Claire's colleagues in Susprams can probably help answer that in a little bit more detail th than I can. But I'm happy to have a chat about it, it in general. In terms of measurable data in Scotland, there will be some and it will be accessible via Susprams. I'm not uh, particularly yeah. okay on a lot of them. However, the projects that I have been involved and spoken to, heard about um, on the continent, they do have measurable data um, and their transport companies are using that data to actively make changes to the way they operate as well. Um, I think it's worth stating that we do cite all these wonderful cities in Europe as being great examples um, because they have an incredibly good public transport structure that is not only reliable, regular, but it's also affordable. Um, and that is linked with active travel initiatives, proper green infrastructure. It's not always been like that. They have been where we are now, and they've had to take those first steps to, to making those changes. And it has taken a while. Oslo, uh, the, when I was there three years ago, they were talking about it's now a, a car-free city centre. But 15 years ago, it wasn't. 
and they had to introduce one Sunday a month being car free and then every Sunday was car free and then as they built the infrastructure and the culture up it became more and more car free and now it is entirely car free so we can't just flick a switch and expect tomorrow everything to be all rosy and shiny there is a process we have to go through it but we also have to start it and I'm going to get off my hobby horse now and see if anybody else has anything to say. Thank you, Emily. Claire, did you just want to come in on that? From yeah, um, I, I think it, it, it's it's very much saying it has been done elsewhere. And I think there is a process of, of, of measurement, measurement and evaluation. Everything that, it, um, you know, what, what Emily has pointed to happening in, in Europe is something that can happen here as well. I do think I was I was looking at Todd's question earlier. I think um, interesting a route i always say a route is only as good as its crappiest junction you know uh, um you can have a wonderful off you know wonderful protected cycle route but then you come it suddenly ends or it comes to a junction or there's severance of the route and suddenly it becomes a a, a tense and 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 anxiety bringing experience particularly and I think, you know, if, if you're cycling with, if you're cycling, talking about cycling with a, a child or, or somebody who isn't confident, you really kind of experience that. Or likewise for walking, um, again, you can have a lovely wide pavement, flat surface, and then suddenly uh, there's pavement parking or it, it ends suddenly. And I think, I think these are all the things that we need to be kind of aware of what are the subliminal signals we're sending out to people? And what are the, what's that kind of little noise in the back of your mind that goes, yeah, I could do it on foot or by bike, but it, it's it's not gonna be pleasant. Do you know what? I'm just gonna get the car. I, I've put in the, in the chat there um, uh, a link to the Walking and Cycling Index, which is a major study that, that Sustrans has been doing over several years. Um, it's evolved from bike life was what it was previously known of, but it's it's focused on walking, wheeling, and cycling, and not just in Scotland, but but throughout the UK and and uh, Northern Ireland and um, Dublin as well. So well worth worth the look about kind of attitudes and what the blockages are. So to answer Todd's, it's it's a mixture of practical things like you need the infrastructure but also sublim subliminal things like you know walkability crossings junctions etc brilliant thank you very much claire i'm conscious of time we've only got a couple of minutes left so if i could just finish with you phil is there anything in the new futures for scotland's towns which could transform this agenda uh, yeah well there's, there's quite a lot if we um look at what Professor Sparks and the review group published, and even the response from Scottish government and, and COSLA. Some of those bigger systemic issues, for example, we know post COVID and climate emergency landscape, we need to create denser residential neighborhoods in our town and city centers. So there's going to be a repopulation piece. We need to make sure that those houses are net zero, low carbon. We need to remove any fiscal disadvantages. For example, we continue to zero rate for VAT sprawl new build developments and farmers fields that all are car dependent and we punish the renovation and retrofit of existing property within town centres by charging them 20 percent so i think there are some fiscal levers that the government are currently looking at just now housing to 2040 national planning framework if we get this piece right this could be transformative not just in terms of reducing our carbon footprint creating much better environments for people to live uh, but also bring an economic and social cohesion together and thinking about community wealth, making sure that the procurement and supply chain is all based in Scotland. We can, we can rebuild our towns and cities and make sure that our population benefits from that. To me, that is the direction that we should be traveling in. And once we have fixed our town and city centers, that's it, it's fixed. It's not a recurring budget problem year on year. So I think there's a real ambition in the new future for Scotland's towns. Let's hope that the politicians have the drive the leadership and the wherewithal to actually push that forward and get moving. Thank you, Phil. I th um, thank everybody for your input today and all our speakers. It really has been fascinating and everybody that's joined us online today. I do not have the, uh, the date of the next meeting, but I'm sure Alison will keep you all in the loop. And thank you very much. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>